likes the emoji thing. Anybody ever use them? I think I asked last week. Yeah, some people do. I know. It's, a, uh, it's our new way of uh, communication. We don't use words anymore, as I mentioned last week, because I guess they're too hard to use acronyms and like short letter phrases and sentences that don't make any sense. And if you read it, as an educated person, which I'm not really an educated person, but I'm semi-educated, it's like it doesn't make sense. But this generation, our young people now, the students and people under probably at least 40, like can decipher that. Maybe 30, I don't know. Does anybody else have trouble deciphering some of the stuff that I have to ask my kids, what does this mean? What does this say? I don't know. It does. It's just a. Uh, it looks like you put your fingers on top of the laptop, and it just started making all these letters and goes across there. But that, that's kind of what I remind, or what I think of when I look at some of these emojis and different things. It gives us opportunities to understand. With these, you can at least see. Okay, this is how I feel. I'm sad. I'm happy. I'm crying. I'm excited. Whatever that looks like. So we've been talking about emotions starting last week. This is week two of our message series, emotions. And when you came in this morning, um, you, you should have received a, a little packet there uh, as, as you uh, walked in. Hopefully it had some talk points, some uh, connection cards. If you are visiting here for the first time, first of all, I just want to welcome you. Bridge family, would you give all of our first-time guests a hand this morning? Thank you for choosing uh, to worship with us this morning. Anybody enjoy the worship experience this morning? I kind of love what Sean said. It's, it's not a performance. It's about honoring God, worshiping God, where he's brought me from, where he's taken us, what we've been through, and that he's always going to be there. And I love that today. But we want to welcome you. If it is your first time, would you fill out that connection card? There's a little QR code right there in the seat in front of you. Hit your phone camera. It pulls up the, the little connect, connection card. And I know if you're like I am, first time visiting somewhere, I'm not putting my information on. Amen. Anybody that's new and you go somewhere, you're like, yeah, I'm not putting my name on anything because what happens? They usually either want something for you or they're going to put you on an email list or they're going to stalk you and send you stuff and you're like, I don't want any more of that. How many gets enough of that? How many spam calls you got this week? They're not from the Bridge Church, I promise. They're not from us. And that's what we offer here at the Bridge is the hassle-free guarantee. We just want to send you one letter and that's it. By putting your name, address, we're going to send you one letter to just share with you what the vision of the Bridge Church is, and just thank you for joining us. Immediately after our worship experience, like she said, there's next steps. You can do that, be a part of that. It's in the door right there between the two sound booths. And what the next steps is, it's not like, okay, I'm you know, joining the church. We want you to come in and connect with you to share the vision of what we're doing. We're going to take it the next step. If you've been coming for a while or if it's your first time and you'd like to know more about that, you can do that immediately after service. We'll sit down with you. We get to share our story. I love to share our story, our vision of how God and what it came or how it came to plant the Bridge Church. We were not just saying, okay, let's go plant a church. My wife and I did not have that in our repertoire or whatever they call that. It was not in our plans. But it's amazing when you go all in with God, where he takes you, what he opens up, and how things change in your life. And we want to share that with you. We'd love to hear your story, where you came from, where you've been, and the things in your life. And that's what Next Steps is about. And if, it's what you, if you want to call the bridge home, that's how we get you plugged in. Get you on a team, get you um, to know people, get you in groups. How many loves to be in connection? Okay, so we got some work to do. <laughs> we all got some work to do. Uh, I love to be in connection, but I like my alone time, amen? I like to be, you know, in the woods by myself or on a fishing bank somewhere by myself. So this part two of emotions. Last week we talked about compassion, what it was, uh, what it was like to be compassion, how Jesus was compassion. He was love. And honestly, that was the word God gave me at the beginning of the year was compassion, compassion, compassion. And when I look at compassion, I'm like, I, I, how many knows it's really easy to get cynical in this world? It's very cynical. I, I have trouble sometimes believing in people or trusting in people, not because I don't want to. 
It's because I've seen the results over and over. And so then I watch social media, I watch the news, and so then I become cynical. Anybody cynical here? Don't say yes. But compassion, that's what we talked about. And you're like, I know, just love like Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. I love Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. But here's what happens. We still fight. We still battle all kinds of emotions, all kinds of feelings, all kinds of things in our lives. And, and sometimes we don't know which way to go. So this morning, I want to talk to you about an emotion that we all deal with to some extent, some worse than others, and that's anxiety. I want to talk to you about anxiety. Anybody, don't raise your hand again, but just ask yourself that question. Do you struggle with anxiety? Okay, what is anxiety? A feeling of worry. It's nervousness, unease, typically about an intimate, <laughs> imminent event or something. <laughs> Did you get it? I just got it too. <laughs> Who wrote that word? They tricked me. <laughs> Imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Just like that phrase. You never know what's going to happen. So now I just have a big rush of anxiety come over. My face is really red. I'm sweating profusely right now. I'm not raising my hands again. I'm just going to praise Jesus with my dinosaur arms. Oh, uh, that's good. I can have fun with it. All right. So who's worried? Who's nervous? Who's uneasy? Something, that, an uncertain outcome. If you're like me, like I just did, I am getting anxious or nervous just thinking about talking about anxiety. According, um, I, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced it. Let me say that first. Have you ever experienced true anxiety or an anxiety attack or panic attack? And maybe you haven't um, identified it yet or even what it looks like because here's the thing. We all process things differently. We all process them in our minds and our emotions completely different than the other person. So you see somebody and you're like, well, just grow up. Stop doing that, right? You tell them, like, well, just quit. That seems silly. It's all in your head. That's easy to say except for when you're the person that has the out-of-body experience that you don't know whether your body's going this way, your mind's going that way, and you're like, I don't know what to do. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, approximately 34% of Americans will have an anxiety disorder at some point in their lives. Some researchers actually believe this to be closer to 50%. 50%. So what type of things cause anxiety? And maybe you have not recognized this yet. Um, so I, I will just share a little story with you. Uh, I deal with anxiety. So I felt like this was a very good plug-in for emotions because it's something that I deal with on a personal level. Seven, eight years ago, I was in the hospital from a panic attack because I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, it was like this feeling came over me, this, this emotion came over me, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I thought I was having a heart attack. I mean, I, I, would, I would like just freak out. I was losing my mind. And they're like, okay, we got to get you to the hospital right now. You know, your chest hurts, your arm hurts, your leg hurts, your mind hurts, everything hurts. Because, and, and, of course, it's all in your mind. But you can't tell yourself that. It doesn't matter what you're doing because you're out of control with your emotion. So something that causes anxiety for me outside of that, um, and I'll share with you a little bit more about my story as I go through this message. But... The first thing, and the first time I really understood anxiety and what that looked like is when they, uh, we lived in Nashville at the time, and I had to fly to Atlanta, Georgia. It was like a, I mean, 45-minute flight maybe in a puddle jumper. You know what a puddle jumper is? It's got two little on each side, and they, you know, he holds like six people, and they got a guy that, you know, is out there with a pull rope starting it. Yeah, that's what they, that's what it felt like. So flying is a huge, was a huge anxiety for me. I'd never flown before. They're like, okay, we need you to go over here for this training. And I'm like, okay, can we drive? I mean, it's really not that far. It's only like 12 hours. And they're like, no, we're going to fly you over, fly you back. So the guy that I was going with, it, he was like 55 years old, and he had never flown before either. So he was no help, no security, no confidence, nothing. He was white as a sheet when we got on the plane. 
And me and him both, obviously not sitting in the same seats, we were across the plane, and we were holding on to the back of the seat in front of us, knuckles white, completely pale, and every time the plane would make a noise, even on the tarmac or wherever that thing is at the, at the airport, we were like, oh, God, it's going to blow. <laughs> Something's falling apart. Take off the plane. The, the wing's going to come off. The engine's going to quit. And so you're thinking all these things, right? Anybody else have those situations where you're in your mind and you're like, oh, all this is going to and this and that and this. And all of a sudden, guess what? Anxiety takes over and you're out of control. It took me years and years to get over that. I still just flew this week. We flew to South Carolina, flew back Thursday. And I was on four different airplanes. Or no, three different airplanes. And it's like, it's still to this point, I'm better now. But like if somebody would have teased on that very first flight and said, oh, I think the engine just quit. I, I don't know. I might have just jumped out. I'm not even sure. But I've gotten better as I've learned and experienced the things that are happening that, okay, it's actually not as bad. It's, it's actually safer to fly than it is to drive. Did you know that? The chances of you getting in a car accident is substantially higher than you getting in a plane accident. But it doesn't matter. When you have that anxiety that comes over you, that emotion that you don't know how to control, you don't know how to harness it. And that's what I want to talk about today is what makes you anxious. Obviously, it may not be flying like it was for me. I still have th things uh, uh, that make me anxious. Maybe it's money. Money makes people anxious. It makes you have an emotion of not being able to pay or not having enough money to pay your bills from month to month or week to week. This is something we experienced. My wife and I, when we were young, we first started getting married. I was working, was making, you know, below minimum wage back then even, and she was still in school. I mean, we had a $200 a month apartment that was, you could put your hand in the bedroom, foot in the bathroom, stand in the kitchen and put your, in the living room. I mean, it was this big. It was about the size of this stage, if that big. And, and I didn't know if we were going to have the money to even pay the rent. And so we had these experiences. So we were going to church. And so what we would do is, is I'd be like, okay, we need to pay all these bills. And then we'll give God what's next. What's left? We'll, 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 we'll lay that to God. We did this for like three years. And we would struggle paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And I would be stressed out about money and money and money. And, and I'd work harder. And she'd, you know, try to make some side money. Here's what I understood. It was something how I had to to channel, to I had to reharness my thinking, just like on an airplane. I understand what the process is now. Once I figured out what God was trying to tell me, there's a scripture that even says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it's not in your notes this morning, but it says, give and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap for the measure of for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So when I think about that, okay, how do I do that? Here's what our, here's how, how we re-altered our thinking. And my wife was kind of the, the lead on this back in the day, but she said, we need to give God the first as soon as it happens. Don't wait till the end and then expect everything to work out. If you give God the first, not just necessarily money, but of your time, uh, of, of everything in our lives, our priority of giving God first, it's going to be shaken. We're going to have it released off of us. Money is probably the biggest stress in most of our lives. How many's got enough? I didn't see anybody raise their hand. Why? Why do we not have enough? Is it because of our priorities? Is it because of how we use it, how we look at it, how we approach it? Does it give us anxiety? Does it give us stress? What happens if we gave God the first thing after every day, every check, every, every moment, every in our time when we wake up? Or here's something else. Family causes anxiety. Too much going on. Anybody in your family got too much going on? You went to 4,782 baseball games yesterday or soccer games or volleyball. Games here, games there. You're traveling to Timbuktu and Washington and California to play travel ball, and you're just all over the place, and your kids got, you know, science and, and Boy Scouts. And so, I mean, you would just go on and on and on and on. 
And here's the thing is, as parents, we want our kids to be as involved as, as much as we can, right? We want to have them as many experiences as they can. Here's what we had to do when our kids started turning into that age where they wanted to play, like Peyton and Ian wanted to play basketball, baseball, football, hockey, soccer, uh, paragliding. I don't know. They just go on down and list, swimming and everything else. And here's what we had to stop. We was like, okay, we can't do everything. Pick two things. And that's what you focus on. Two things. We had to control what it was because of the anxiety. We'd lose control of what was going on. Or maybe it's work. Something going on at work. Or there's people in your lives that's causing you stress, causing you anxiety. Or maybe it's your weight. You can't lose it. Because if you're like me, you like to eat. And they just don't go hand in hand very good. I've yet to figure it out. I'm wanting to eat and lose weight. If y'all figure that out, would you let me know? Schedules. Maybe it's tests. Students. You're stressed out about a test and you're overwhelmed with what's going on. But did you study? Did you actually go through the curriculum? Or here's, I mean, for, for guys and ladies, I guess, the stress of what you're going to wear today. Was it overwhelming you this morning or tomorrow? Does my hair look just right? Um, this is what I stress about. I don't really stress about what I wear because I don't ultimately care too much about that. Um, but I do stress about where we're going to eat after church. <laughs> I've been thinking about it for about two hours now. <clears throat> and then we argue about it all the way from the church to wherever we end up going. Because we got to give a list. Well, I gave you two. It's your turn. you got to pick two. And I don't want that. I don't want this. Anybody else deal with that? It's complicated. It's very complicated. But it causes anxiety within you that you don't even know. And anxiety can be complicated. It can be physical. It can be emotional. It can be situational or even spiritual. You may need to see a doctor for it. And you're like, well, I'm not doing that because I can just deal with it, right? Did that for years and years and years. You could go see a doctor or go see a counselor. It's okay because here's what happens. It may be something that's hereditary, something that's passed down and out of your control. And I promise they, they do make medicine. I'm not a huge pusher of medicines and, and you need to take stuff. But if it's out of control, if you have to have it for a temporary season to get it back under control till you figure out why and what's causing it. It's okay to say no to some things in your life. Can I get an amen? amen? You don't have to say yes to everything in every situation, every opportunity, everyone that comes to you. You don't have to say yes to everything. That gets overwhelming. But the area I want to talk about today and really dig into is about a spiritual side, how it affects us spiritually. So when I deal with anxiety and I've dealt with it for years, even in my own life, I have to ask myself, if I'm anxious, am I really letting God down? Am I failing at what God really wants me to do? Am I sinning because I'm not obeying and I'm not trusting God? So then I have to say, is my heart really right? Does anybody else think like that? Like other emotions, anxiety doesn't necessarily and doesn't mean that you're letting God down. But here, our response to anxiety is what can lead down negative roads, and that's what can lead us into sin. Because we can take a, a, a tailspin. It's like once you start out of control, you see people in their lives, and you see them start going out of control, out of control. It's like they go down this, this tailspin, downward, downward, and you're like, stop. Why are you doing that? You're, you're, you don't need to. But when you're in the middle of that, you can't see it. Because you've allowed your emotions to take control of your life. How did Jesus deal with anxiety? He experienced all the same things, all the same emotions that we do. Because when he walked on this earth, he was to live and lead as the example of everything that we would have to go through. So he had to experience everything. We talked about last week, there's over 39 different emotions that we feel that we go through. Unless you're married. And then there's more with your wife. Oh, <laughs> I was kidding. Our husbands. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> but he experienced the same emotions that we do. So I'm, I'm assuming that what Jesus did 
is what he shows us in the word. How did he deal with it? How did he deal with anxiety? How did Jesus work through it? He experienced all these same things. So how did he deal with it? He dealt with it by talking. He dealt with it by talking. I guess my wife is loaded with anxiety. <laughs> she likes to talk. I do too, so I really can't say anything. I, that's probably what's wrong with me too. But we're going to look at three different ways this morning. I want to go real quickly through three different ways of how he and ways that he talked through anxiety that he was experiencing. And I'm going to show you some of the anxiety that he dealt with and situations that he went through. And the first one that we have to do is talk to your friends. That's the first thing that you need to try to do. And I'm not talking about when I say friends, it's not somebody that you just talked to a week ago. This is someone that you can trust with your kids, with your family, with your finances, people that you could trust, people that you have invested, sown into. Those are the people I'm talking about. Not acquaintances, somebody at your work, some coworkers, somebody you just met on the street. That's not who I'm talking about. Talk to your friends, people that love you, that have your, your benefit on their side, your best interests. So after the Last Supper, Jesus was with his closest friends in that moment. People that he trusted, people that was very close to him. It was his connect group, his core friends, people that he, he hung around that knew him and he knew them. Not just anybody, but someone close. Mark chapter 14 is the scripture I want to read to you today. Starting with verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And then verse 33 goes on and says that he took Peter, James, John along with him and he began to deeply, be deeply distressed and troubled. Distressed, troubled. Something was, something was in him. He was, he was experiencing anxiety. Of, what do I do? How do I deal with this? He was, he was experiencing the same thing that we experienced. So I want you to look how the message writes this same scripture of, of verse 33. He plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. He didn't really know what to do, where to turn, how to go. Anybody else relate to that? The moment you can't breathe, everything feels like the weight of the world's laying on you. We don't know what to do, where to turn, who to turn to. Jesus knew what was coming. I can only imagine him leading up to the crucifixion, what he had to have experienced in those moments as a man and as God, as the sacrifice, as the son of man walking, robed in flesh, God robed in flesh, and experiencing the same emotions that we experience. I can only imagine what he was thinking. I have to lead up. I have to go through all this suffering, all this pain, all this agony. So he was experiencing it beforehand internally. Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows the emotion of anxiety. He knows what you're dealing with. He knew he was about to die. He knew he was about to become our sin, to pay the price of our sin. He was perfect. He had never done anything wrong. He had never sinned. But have you ever noticed how hard it is to be completely honest with someone? Last week, or we talked about, you know, how you doing? And everybody says, we're fine, we're good, everything's good. And you know that you're lying through your teeth. You know that you're not being honest with yourself and that person or God. When people say, how you doing? Now, and I get it. We talk about that, usually it's in passing. But if you're in that moment and somebody really asks you, how are you doing? How are you really doing? And it's someone you can trust. You don't have to hold back. Say, hey, man, can we grab some coffee? I really need something to talk to you about. I really am not fine. I really am searching, looking, dealing with certain things. But look how honest Jesus is with his friends. He shared with them what he was thinking, what he was feeling. Because it sounds like in verse 34, he was freaking out just a little bit internally. Verse 34 says that my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He was at the point, I can imagine just like myself, feeling like I can't breathe. What, what's going to happen? I'm having this panic attack, this anxiety. 
And he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Kind of keep watch over me. Watch, watch what's going on. Help me to get through this. Jesus talked to his friends. He shared with him some of the deepest conversations of how he was feeling. I can imagine he had to let this out in order to be the example. When we lack community, when we lack people in our lives, when we go through a pandemic, a quarantine, anybody ever experienced one of those here in the last few years? They've isolated us by ourselves, separate you from people. They keep you away. Guess what happens? Your mind plays tricks. It goes into a rat race. The world has become more anxious in the last couple years than ever before because of loneliness, because of separation, because it separates us from people being able to communicate, to be able to have community, to be able to speak, to be able to share with people what's going on. Because there's a difference between praying for and praying with. Praying for is good. How many likes to pray for somebody? I love to pray for people. I I feel selfish when I pray for myself or my own needs. But when it's for somebody else, anybody else know it's really easy to pray for somebody? I like when people pray for me. I like to pray for people. But when we pray with each other, when we are both praying for the same thing, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is also. It's okay to get together and pray with someone. I know it's uncomfortable sometimes for people. When you feel anxiety, don't wait. Don't wait till it compiles up and then it's out of control. Find someone. Talk to the people God has placed and put into your life. Because how many knows that pride is one of the biggest things to un- overcome in letting your guard down? Pride. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to share my problems. I don't want to give them the stuff that I'm dealing with. Because one, do they really care? Do do I need to share that? Do do they know? I don't want to shame myself. I don't want to go through this. Maybe you're new in town. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you feel like you don't have any friends. Maybe you've you've done something and, and you don't really have anybody to turn to. Your friends have left you. They've put you to the side. I can promise you that you're in luck today. Because just in a few weeks, just like she said, we're going to have sign-ups for our summer connect groups. This summer, Wednesday nights, what we're going to do is it's going to be designed to have a group for everyone. And how many loves to eat? And when you bring food in, it attracts people. Especially me. But I've heard that there's going to be food. We're going to do Wednesday nights right here at the church. We're going to have a a collective connect group to create opportunity for community, for connection. And with God, food, people, conversation, guess what? Anxiety does not stand a chance. It doesn't stand a chance in your life. And I encourage you, I encourage you to be involved in that. So be on the lookout for that just like she was talking about. Second thing, I want to give you, talk to your father. I'm not talking about your physical father. I'm talking about your heavenly father. It's okay if you talk to your father as well, but talk to your heavenly father. How many has ever been driving in your car and you're driving down the road and all of a sudden this warning light pops up on the dash? Bing! Or it makes like three beeps. Beep, beep, beep. What do you do? You just keep on going? Yes. I love honesty. Because denial is the worst thing that you can do. The check engine light comes on, or the oil pressure light comes on, or the low tire light comes on. There's lights for everything. I was, we were in a car when we were in South Carolina this week, and, and I kept saying, who is grabbing the steering wheel? I was driving, and I'd go to turn to get in another lane, and it kept pulling me back. I'm like, what is going on with this car? It's the driving assist thingy. So when the light came on every time and the the lines would turn red and we'd be like, "You're, you're, you're, you're swerving again or something. I don't know. So you had to push a button to turn it off. But when that light comes on, it's like you automatically get this feeling. It's like, oh, there goes (laughs) $4,000. Bye-bye. Should you go get it looked at? Should you have it looked at? Should you have somebody 
take a look at it that's above your pay grade? Or do you ignore it like my wife does? Oh, that light's been on for a while, she says. But it's still running, still doing good. It's just everything seems fine. It just beeps every time we get in. No, no, it's not fine. We need to look at it. But if she was not, if she doesn't share it with me, I don't know that there's something wrong. If she don't communicate that with me and she just keeps driving it, guess what? The engine blows up. Then we're in a catastrophe. Same thing with anxiety. When, it, when the light goes off, it's that little light. Whenever it pops and you feel it inside, like, ooh, I just don't. That's a warning light. That's God giving you a warning light. You need to talk to somebody. You need to tell somebody what's going on in your life. Don't keep just driving and going because eventually it's going to all blow up. Stop. Have a conversation. Find someone that you can communicate with. Find someone that loves you. Find someone that you can connect with. That's what connect groups are for is to give you the opportunity for God to put people in your lives, for you to share the warning lights in your life. Jesus talked to his friends. And then he went to talk to his heavenly father. That's what he did when he went into that garden. It goes on in in verse 35 and 36. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, if if possible, the hour might pass from him. In verse 36, he said, I have a father. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Basically, he was saying, I don't want this anymore. I'm giving it to you, God. I'm giving it to you, Father. You take control. Take this cup. He was just being honest. Sometimes we need to just, we don't know what to say sometimes, but just be honest. We have resources here at the church, at the bridge, that we we give. Uh, There's an app on your phone that you can get. It's called Pray First. I encourage you to download it. I encourage you to get it. It's an amazing tool to use to help you go through specific prayers in your life, for your life, your family, your circumstances. Use it. Pray first. It's what it's called, the Pray First app. Or you can even get a book copy of a paperback book if you want that. There's books you can read for anxiety. There's there's things that you can use. You can start a journal, write things down. All of these things are awesome tools, awesome things to have. But don't forget to have a real conversation. He knows how you're feeling. He knows what you're going through, the circumstance that you're dealing with. And I want you to understand today, if you don't leave with anything else, that he can take care of it. He can take care of it. I've walked it. I've experienced it. And I've had to give it to him. Because there's something, and I I use this terminology a lot, there is something about clearing the air between even yourself, within yourself, with God, with, with people. Clear the air. It's one of the hardest things to do because sometimes we feel ashamed of maybe what we've done or we've had that emotion drive us so far. We've ignored the warning light till we've done something that feels like it's irreversible. And God's saying, no, that's not the case. Don't let the enemy tell you that stuff. You feel ashamed or scared of what someone might think or what someone might say. I used to wake up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning with anxiety attacks. And I'd be like, what is going on? This is so stupid. This is so dumb. And I'd wake up in a cold sweat. My pillow would be soaking wet. I'd get up and, and, and I'd go take a cold shower. I'd go outside. I'd go sit in a chair. I feel like somebody was sitting on my chest. I felt like the world was closing in. My mind wouldn't stop racing. I was thinking about things that I didn't have control over. And they would just worry. It would make me sick. I'd be sick to my stomach. And I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? Lord, am I dying? Is this the end? Is is it over? I used to wake up my wife and I'd talk to her after I got kind of used to doing this on occasion or, you know, once or twice a week. I didn't even wake her up. I would just try to take care of it myself because I'm like, okay, it's all just in your mind. Stop thinking about it. Stop doing it. And I know that's so easy to say. And you're probably, some of you are going like, it really is. There's something always going to be eating at each of us for some reason, some circumstance. 
And I'd, I'd pray, I'd pray, God, just help me get over this. Let me get through this. Let me deal with this. I, I, I don't want to feel like this no more. I, I'm tired of this. I'd grab the Bible. I'd read. I'd start reading. I'd start reading. I'd start reading. And, then, and, and, and eventually, as I prayed and as I started reading, I could kind of feel like this, this calming me down. And my mind would slow down. And I've actually helped people in the past dealing with this. And, and if you're dealing with it today, I want to tell you that you can message me and I will send you scriptures to help you find and to pray with you over these circumstances. I don't want you to feel ashamed or scared or any of that stuff. Message me on Facebook, find my phone number, whatever, text me because I promise when those warning lights are going off, you need to speak to somebody. That's what we're here for. If you need a scripture, the one I always start with, the one I started with, this is the one that changed my life probably eight years ago in a way that I don't deal with that stuff like I used to. I still have anxiety sometimes about it, but it's nothing like it was because of God. If you need a scripture, the one I went to, it's my favorite, favorite verses in the Bible. It's actually my favorite chapter in the Bible. Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to read the whole chapter, and I've sent this chapter to several people over the years. Just read the chapter, the whole chapter, but towards the second half of the chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. So therefore, when I seek first, I'm eliminating everything else that I'm thinking. I'm putting God first in my thoughts. And his righteousness to do good, to do what God did, or what Jesus did. And these things will be given to you as well. What things? The things I'm worried about, the things I'm concerned with, the things that I'm dealing with, the things that I want, my needs, money, circumstances, situation, kids, all of that stuff, I'm gonna seek God and he's gonna provide it. He's gonna give it because guess what? The next scripture is the one that I want you to take hold of. Because if you think you have control, you don't. It's an illusion. That was a revelation for me as well, even in my own life. 34 goes on and says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. You can't worry about tomorrow. I got so consumed about what was going to happen tomorrow, but look what it says, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day, each day has enough trouble of its own. Can I get an amen? Don't worry about what tomorrow holds. Don't worry about what the circumstances. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you go pull out all your savings and blow it today, okay? I mean, you need to invest into the future, but don't lay in bed in cold sweats where you can't breathe because you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Pray, God, give me the strength to get through this day, and I know if you'll get me through this day, you're going to be with me the next day, the next day, the next day, the circumstance, the situation. You're going to be with me. That's what it looks like to talk to your heavenly father. And with those scriptures, with those words that he spoke in the Bible, can I tell you they're alive and that there's power in them. There's power and there is, there, there is, there is life in the words of what the Bible say. Third thing, talk to your feelings. This one's kind of fun, okay? Because you see people talking to themselves all the time, right? Maybe that's what they're doing. If you see me talking to myself, I'm probably talking to my feelings. Stop thinking like that. Stop doing that. What are you thinking? Do your feelings ever go crazy? Follow your heart and trust your feelings, right? No, that's a lie. If I follow my feelings, I'll probably end up in jail. <laughs> I have to follow the truth. Your feelings, your feelings are real and they're important, don't get me wrong, but they're not always true. They're not always worth following. You tell them, and this is where you get to talk to yourself in case you're wondering, and it's okay. You tell them, you don't control me. You have no control over me. When that, when that comes over me, I'm like, get away from me, Satan. You have no control over me. You can't. You can't. I have the living God living in me, walking with me. You don't control me. Anxiety, sadness, depression, these different things, you don't own me. 
you find that scripture, like I just talked about, to speak truth to your feelings. If you can't find one, again, message me. I'd love to send you something, send you scriptures to help you read, to help you get through it. Verse 36 says it this way. Abba, Father, as we read, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. I love when you take everything off of you and give it to him. Isn't that refreshing when you can think about it in that perspective that I don't have to carry this. I can say, God, here it is. You carry it. You take it. Jesus didn't want to hurt. He didn't want to be rejected, just like we don't. None of us want to. But tell yourself the truth. Your feelings say, well, God doesn't love me because I've messed up too bad. I've, I've made too many mistakes. Find a scripture to combat it. John 3, 16 is a perfect one. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God doesn't love me, really? He comes, like the song said, over and over and over again. There's nothing that you can do while you're still breathing that God won't forgive you for. Think about that. That doesn't mean you just go live lavishly and however you want, just do whatever you want. I think we need to have moral compasses and standards and things in our lives to reach towards. But if you fall, if you make a mistake, say, well, I messed up. I'm not coming to church. God doesn't love me. They don't love me. I'm ashamed. I'm scared. I'm afraid. That's what the enemy wants you to think. That's a lie. When you feel alone, God will never leave me or forsake me. When you're worried about money, God is my provider. When you're afraid, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That was another scripture I used a lot. Your mind tells you, I can't go on, I can't go on, I can't go on, I can't do this. It's too much, it's too heavy, it's too overwhelming. In Christ, I can do all things. Quit saying, in, well, in me, I can do it all. No, you can't. But I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Jesus talked to his friends, to his father, to his feelings. And guess what? It worked. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do today when you're dealing with this emotion, with this, this circumstance, this situation. Going back to the scripture in Philippians, uh, Paul wrote, from prison... I'm sure he had some anxiety about being in prison as well. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Whatever you're worried about. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's politics, the economy, a decision, whether it's a financial decision or about your kids your health, but it says to pray about anything, especially what you're going to eat this afternoon. <laughs> Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that there's power in that scripture. If you're dealing with anything today, I want you to read that. And sometimes I have to read it over and over and over and over to say, God, put it in me, instill it in me, put it in my mind, put it in my heart. So my question this morning is, is what, is what is God saying to you? What is the Spirit of God speaking to you this morning? I pray that it's speaking to you specific things that you're going through, circumstances that you're dealing with, and I'm praying that God's giving you an answer this morning, or he's going to give you a scripture, he's going to give you a word, he's going to put somebody in your path to change your trajectory, to change where you're headed. Maybe you're out of control, maybe your life's out of control, you don't know where to turn. Can I tell you it's him? It's God, it's the Holy Spirit. But my question is, have you been open? Have you been honest with him? Are you just saying, you know what? I see the engine lights are on. They're running. It's been on for a while. I've been maintaining. Stop. Talk to somebody. Get it checked out. 
Find someone that's a specialist in that area and say, God, what, what, what can I do? What scripture can I have? God, can you speak something into me? Overhaul my life. Retrajectory me. Put me in the place where I need to be. But you have to be open. You have to stop, look at the sign, and then fix it. So I want to pray with you today that God would speak into your life right now. And whatever the Spirit of God is pointing out to you, whatever he's speaking to you about, whatever he's talking to you about, whatever you're worried about, I want you right now as I pray for you, I want you to just, and you can say it and just say, God, I give it to you. God, I give it to you. If that's all you can say, that's okay. As they turn the lights down, heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. I want to take a moment for God just to speak, speak into your life. Because I I can only do so much. Family members can only do so much. Friends can only do so much. But there's something that God can do above and beyond that any of us can do. But right now, Father, we come before you. Lord, I know that some of us are, are just weighed down. We're tired. We're tired of the heaviness. We're tired of the anxiety, the worry, the fret, the, the depression, the things that, 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 that are weighing down on this life. Lord, I pray that you would speak truth into our lives at this moment today, God. That you would intervene in those situations, God. That you would put somebody in their path, a scripture, a word from you in their life. But remind us, God, remind us, show us, speak it to us, that you are greater than any problem, any circumstance, any situation that we might face. Help us to open up to the people that you've put and placed in our lives, that we can be okay, honest, and upfront. to speak honestly to them and ultimately to you, Lord. Let us not be led by our own feelings, but to be led by the truth of your words, to the truth of who you are. And I pray that you would speak to each of us today and continue, Lord, the work that you've started in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to pray, I never like to close a service or leave a service without giving somebody an opportunity to to just beginning the journey with Christ, to walking with Him, to having that relationship, that communion with Him. And I realize it's it's much easier to talk to people when you've developed a relationship with people and And maybe you're not able to talk with God because you really haven't ever developed a real relationship with Him. You've never really got to know Him. Or maybe you've been in a relationship with Him and and you've walked away or maybe you've been pulled away or you've kind of been out of control and, and you're heading down a path that you know you shouldn't be going down. Can I tell you that God robed Himself in flesh as Jesus, fully man and and fully God. He suffered the pain of the cross so that the debt of sin that we all owe or we all owed would be paid by him. And I want you to know that sin separates us from God. But when we accept what Jesus did, our sins at the cross, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what we've done, I want you to know that it's forgiven today. And we begin and can begin that relationship with God. If you want to begin or maybe even recommit to a relationship with Jesus Christ today, I want you to know it starts like any other relationship with a conversation. It starts with a conversation. Religion is overcomplicated this. It's so simple. It's a simple prayer. That's where it begins. Because the Bible tells us, even in Scripture, that if we confess, we talk with our mouth and we believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that he was raised by God from the dead, it says that we're going to be saved. If you're ready to have that conversation today, if you're you're ready to take that next step, to ready to say, God, I'm all in. I need to know you. I I want to know you. I want to to walk with you. 
to have a relationship. I want to commune with you. I want to restore that relationship. When I count to three, I want you to do one thing. I just want you to raise your hand with nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed, one more time. If that's you today, if you don't have a relationship with God, if you don't have it today, I want you to know that you can walk away today beginning that journey right now. When I count to three, would you just be bold enough to say that's me by raising your hand? We're not going to come back to you. We're not going to have you come up here. This is between you and your Savior, Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Would you be bold enough to raise your hand and just say that's me? I don't have a relationship. I need a relationship with God. I need to walk with you. I need to start it today. I need it. I need it. Now, would you just pray with me, church? If you don't know how to pray this morning, you can say it in these words. If you know how to pray and you need to recommit your life to God today, I want you to do that now. Say, Jesus, thank you for choosing to lay down your life for me. I turn away from my sins. Forgive me for trying to do life on my own and do it my own way. Today, I turn from that and I turn to you. I believe that you died, you rose again so that I could have a new life. And from this day forward, the best way that I know how, I'm gonna live for you. I will not be led by my emotions anymore, but I'm gonna be led by you and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would somebody give God some praise this morning? Celebrate with those that have made a decision today, that have recommitted. Would you stand one more time as we worship Him? Thanks for listening to today's message. We pray that it strengthened, encouraged, and empowered you. We would love to connect with you. So if you have questions, need prayer, or simply want to let us know how this message has helped you, please send an email to info at thebridgechurchmo.org. To stay up to date with all the events at The Bridge, follow us on Facebook and Instagram.